Welcome on in, everybody, for another edition of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I'm Zach Farmer, and in this one, again, tournament week, so we'll be doing a lot of different interviews uh, covering both St. Mary's, Gonzaga, and we'll touch on USF as well. Uh, in this one, um, I'm welcome to have back Andy Patton from the Locked On Zags and Locked On College Basketball podcast. We will dive into what the Zags are going to be looking at against McNeese State, how, how Zag Nation is feeling, and where he thinks that this team can go what's kind of the ceiling for the zags and really it's kind of like what the outlook is for the rest of the tournament and the rest of the season for the team in spokane even though they will not be playing in spokane this weekend because that's where st mary's is playing but again uh we'll talk with andy always great to chat with him so we'll dive into it uh with with andy Patton from locked on zags it is always great to bring on Andy Patton from the Locked On Zags podcast, the Locked On College Basketball podcast. You've heard you, he's been around a lot on this podcast. Andy, thanks for hopping on. It is the eve of Gonzaga basketball in the NCAA tournament. One more time, uh, what, how are you feeling uh, about their draw? Just the seed line, all of it as we've kind of gone in these last few days. Zach, as somebody who has been paying attention to WCC all season long, you know what the narrative was like all year long. You know what it was in November, December, in January after the Santa Clara lost. You know how it flipped in February after the Kentucky win. Like It has been a very up and down season, more than we're used to seeing at least the last half decade or so in Spokane. And for it to have culminated in Gonzaga getting a five seed, which is like kind of the exact middle point of what they have done over the last 25 years. I think I pulled the numbers in like 12 of the last 24 seasons. They've been over a five seed uh, and then like 13, they've been lower than a five seed. This is actually their first time being an actual five seed, which I thought was interesting. Uh, it's just a, it's it's was unexpected to get here the way that we did, even though Mark Few told us constantly, OK, be patient. Like we're still getting there. We're still finding our way. Uh, this team obviously had a, a red hot end of the season outside of the loss in that WCC championship game. Five was obviously unexpected. There were some you know, exterior reasons for that with BYU and the kind of wonkiness of, of them not being able to play on Sunday and not being able to play Kansas as a four seed resulted in them getting a lower seed. That f made sense to me. I was surprised when I first heard it, but I was like, BYU should have been a higher seed than Gonzaga, even though I'm I'm not a huge believer in BYU. Their resume was better, and the committee agreed. It's just how it shook out. So excited to see Gonzaga back in the in a five seed when we were having conversations two months ago about like, can this team lose any more games if they want to make the NCAA tournament? What happens if they don't beat Kentucky, et cetera, et cetera? To to have put all of that so far in the rearview mirror that we're just kind of feeling ho-hum about a five seed is is a testament to what Mark Few has been able to build at Gonzaga over the last two decades and also just kind of how, how, how this fan base has operated is the expectations are so high that we were disappointed for the majority of the season that resulted in uh, a seed that is most teams would kill for. Right. I mean, it is kind of wild just where we started with this Gonzaga team, thinking about the, the loss to Purdue and then the kind of then the the subpar results that ended up being UCLA and yeah. USC and and just the fact that it looked like, oh, there was not that marquee win. And then as we've kind of gone through the season, it looks like they've landed right back where we're so used to seeing mm -hmm. them uh, being being the favorite in the NCAA tournament in their first round matchup against a McNeese team that a lot of people are really high on. Yeah. A lot of people have have them as the upset pick. I am not going down that road because I have seen this Gonzaga team way too mm -hmm. often in this situation. But with this McNeese team, it does it, there is some familiarity. Uh, they do have some level of experience, like head coaching, point guard experience in the NCAA tournament. But as you're kind of reading this map, as you kind of initially saw it, kind of dug a little bit deeper, how are you reading this first um, go-around for the Zags? 
You know, yeah, McNeese is a team that I, I liked coming into the tournament and I think had some upset potential. I don't like this matchup for McNeese, which is to say I like this matchup for Gonzaga. And I think a lot of people who were high on McNeese, a lot of national media people who who have loved this team, who you know have loved Will Wade, have interacted with him, who are kind of like pumped up about this McNeese team. Frankly, I think a lot of them were going to uh, Sharpie McNeese in on their bracket regardless of who they played because looking at this from a matchup perspective – it's it's not a great matchup for McNeese. I, they don't have a lot of size. I think their tallest player who, who's in the rotation is 6'7", 230. Uh, Graham Ike is just so much bigger. Even Anton Watson's bigger. Even Braden Huff is bigger for this team. And so I think that the size is going to be an issue. Uh, McNeese does like to slow the pace down, and that has tripped up Gonzaga in the past. They also play two to three games a year against St. Mary's, so they're familiar with kind of playing against teams that slow that pace, uh, which I think will work in their favor in this contest. Uh, McNeese is excellent at turning teams over, but their strength of schedule is not good. And as somebody who follows mid-major basketball as closely as I do, I kind of hate bagging on teams that don't have strong schedules because a lot of times mid-major teams cannot control this. It's not Will Wade's fault, especially as a new coach, that this schedule is the way that it is. But it matters when you're evaluating analytics like turnover rate and, oh, the teams shoot poorly against McNeese's uh, from three. And it's like, yeah, but a lot of those teams are just bad that they were playing. So how much, you know, it's hard to, that doesn't mean that McNeese isn't a good defensive team. That doesn't mean that they're not good at causing turnover. It just kind of means that we don't know. Like they, they, they played one team that made the NCAA tournament. It was UAB, the Blazers, who was a 12 seed, only got in because they won the American Athletic Conference Championship. They played one team that was ranked in the top 100 in Ken Palm. That was VCU. Now, they won both those games, and that is an important distinction. If they had lost those games and all of their wins came against like 200-plus Ken Palm teams, we'd probably feel a little different. But they had a 20-plus point win over a team in the top 100. That doesn't mean nothing. I mean, that certainly means something, but that was also like their, I think, their actual first game of the year. So they're a harder team to pin down because their average strength of schedule this year from Ken Palm was 240th. And like... As much as there's a national narrative that, oh, Gonzaga and St. Mary's, they play high school teams. Like, no, the Southland Conference is 28th out of 33, according to Ken Palm. The WCC is, what, I think 11th? Like, there's a big difference between those two conferences. And, and so that makes me a little bit less. I just don't think McNeese is the right matchup for Gonzaga, while I think they could be a trendy, popular pick for other reasons. I just don't think it works here. And I think it's it's a good draw for Gonzaga with the matchup against McNeese and then potentially a matchup against either Kansas or Samford, which I, I think are both pretty good matchups for Gonzaga as well. So hard to hate the draw here, even though I like McNeese as a team, don't love them against the Zags. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm with you and you brought up Graham EK because again, like it, I mean, even WCC teams have had a hard time mm -hmm. stopping and slowing down uh, Graham EK. And really you can make the case. The only reason St. Mary slowed him down was because he got a foul trouble because yeah. he still had 10 points. I think in the 19 minutes uh, he played uh, in that contest, but even more so that, I mean, one of the guys who seems to rise when the occasion calls for it is Ryan Nemhart. Yeah. He's a, I mean, that's someone who we saw what he did in the tournament a year ago with Creighton and the performances he was able to put on. Yeah, he also had kind of a a, a not great game against St. Mary's. He shot six mm -hmm. for 14 from the field, so it wasn't a good night for him either. But that's another one. And like, I mean, this is going to be a really good point guard matchup. I do feel like that's kind of like one of like the marquee. If you're going to look circle something as matchup wise, mm -hmm. that's kind of it in this game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the, to take the EK side of it, one thing that, that McNeese does well, Shahada Wells, their point guard in particular, does well is getting putting pressure on the rim and trying to cause fouls. And it's interesting because McNeese is really good at getting to the free throw line. It's clearly an emphasis for them offensively is to try to draw contact, get to the stripe. They're not a good free throw shooting team, which is kind of strange that they put so much F emphasis on let's get to the line, let's get 20 plus free throw attempts per game. We're going to shoot sub 70%. But against Gonzaga, that's probably the best avenue for success. We've seen games where Graham E.K. has sat 12 minutes and it is not good for Gonzaga. And, and that's that's where this McNeese team could pull a victory. But on the Nemhard side of things, you're absolutely right. 15 and a half points, nine assists, two turnovers per game in his last eight. That is where Ryan Nemhard has been. And again, to, to kind of pick on the national media a little bit, as much as I think Shahada Wells is great, if you're hearing the media that, oh, this is like, you know, the, the best point guard in this game might not be at, at Gonzaga or anything like kind of, oh, Nemhard's been struggling. Like those people haven't watched Gonzaga since February. Like that, there's just no way to 
truly not believe that Ryan Nembhard is the superior point guard in this game or to not believe that he has been playing well this season unless you stop watching this team after the Santa Clara game. Like, he has been so, so good since then. He's he's really good at taking care of the basketball. And again, that goes back to the thing with McNeese. If your main argument that they can pull an upset is how often they turn the basketball over, they haven't played a point guard like Ryan Nemhart. Very few teams have. And even Nolan Hickman in his last eight games as well, I think he's averaging about four assists and less than one turnover. I mean, this team has just taken really good care of the basketball lately. And I think, you know, I mean, if, if Nemhard can run circles around St. Mary's as defenders, what is he going to do to this McNeese team? Yeah, they have athletes. Yes, Shahada Wells plays at TCU, played at TCU and was very good for them off the bench. But I just, I, I think that Nemhard and EK are going to be too much. And I think they neutralize a lot of the strength that McNeese has. And as long as those guys play their game, as long as EK doesn't get two fouls in the first eight minutes, uh, this Gonzaga team should have a really, really good chance of advancing uh, to the route of 32. Yeah, I, I have them advancing in my bracket. And then the second round matchup is where it does get interesting because you mentioned uh, the probably a favorable matchup against Samford and, and then also Kansas, who, as it was announced yesterday, got a big blow with Kevin McCullers uh, being out for the tournament. And obviously there's still also the kind of like the, is Hunter Dickinson going to play as awesome. well? That's another kind of wrinkle to what this weekend could end up being. I mean, this Zags team, it really does seem like they got, got set up really well and kind yeah. of almost lucked out to an extent of just like, but that happens in the tournament. Like sometimes yeah. it's, these sorts of things happen and, but it really does look like that they're set up well to get to that Sweet 16 again. Yeah. And is that kind of like how you're rating it? Because like it feels like, and and could they get further? Because I know Purdue is kind of sitting mm -hmm. there and covering, and uh, but a lot of people don't have faith in Purdue yeah. or whatnot. So generally, the rest of the pod, you kind of touched on it briefly, but what's how are you feeling about it? Yeah, I think. Gonzaga definitely did get a little bit lucky with the McCullough injury. I mean, that just is one of those things that happens. Kansas uh, is a four seed that really is is not playing like a four seed right now. I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, the, the issue with them is pretty simple. They have four good players, and one of them is not playing. Hunter Dickinson is great. K.J. Adams is great. Dewan Harris is great. Kevin McCullough, when he's healthy, is, is the best player on that team. But when he's not there, you don't have a lot of other depth. Johnny Furphy's going to have to step up in a huge way. But the way that Samford plays – uh, they call it Bucky Ball, their head coach, uh, Bucky McMillan. They play a lot of press. They put a lot of pressure on you. And against a team that has very, very little depth, I could see an upset there. I 100% could see an upset. My co-host for Locked On College Basketball, Isaac Shade, uh, he has Samford as an upset. He also has Samford in the Sweet 16, so the Zag fans can go boo him there if they want to. But uh, that, that Samford team is really good. And if Gonzaga gets them, they're, they're gonna, it's going to be an adjustment because of just the style that they play. Uh, obviously, you don't really want to face Kansas either just because Bill Self is so successful. But I feel good about Gonzaga's chances in the McNeese game and in the winner of that game as well. And then you likely end up playing Purdue. Of course, you never know. Uh, I, I have circled Utah State as a team to watch there. I think there's a chance if they beat TCU that they could pull off an upset over Purdue as well. Uh, but Gonzaga was leading against Purdue at halftime. Uh, and this was the uh, uh, not nearly the version of Gonzaga that we've seen lately. Uh, now, Purdue has improved as the year has gone on as well. And I think that is an, an, an important, notable point. But Gonzaga is absolutely capable of beating Purdue. Uh, anybody who tells you otherwise uh, probably didn't watch that game <laughs> at that point, too. But I, I'm not saying they're going to be favored or that they will. I think they are capable of beating Purdue, whereas I'm not sure they're capable of beating a fully healthy UConn team. I'm not sure they're capable of beating a fully healthy Houston team. Carolina is is probably the weakest of the one seeds, but honestly, Carolina is not a good matchup for Gonzaga. I don't think Gonzaga would beat Carolina either. Purdue's the team I think they could beat. So yeah, I, I could see Gonzaga in the Elite Eight. And if they're there, I really hope they're playing Creighton because that would be a really fun story of the Ryan Nemhard uh, kind of reunion playing against this old team in Creighton. I, I, I would like that for a narrative perspective. Creighton's really good and could probably beat Gonzaga in that game. But if Gonzaga's in the Elite Eight, we're playing with house money at that point. We're fine if we if we don't make it past there. But yeah, this region has set up in a way that I think is potentially pretty advantageous for the Zags, uh, just just with the way some of the, the those teams have shaken out. Yeah, uh, I'm with you there. I think I have the Zags to the Sweet 16 in my bracket. I think mm -hmm. I do have them then losing to Purdue at that yeah. point. But again, you kind of you look at that matchup. You look at what what we saw back in November, and you're right. I think both of those squads are different teams than what we saw earlier in the year. They're both better. Um, and we know just like conquering uh, Zach Eady seems to just be a monumental task. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So as you kind of like look across the bracket, going on to the other side, St. Mary's is matched up with Grand Canyon. And on the Locked On College Basketball podcast, you had the Lopes t- uh, knocking off St. Mary's in that 5-12 matchup. A lot of people also have that 5-12 and have circled that. And and there is a lot, obviously a lot of reasons to kind of point to the advantages that Grand Canyon has. So I got to kind of, I got to call you out a little bit. I'm just like, all right, what's, what do you see about this Grand Canyon team that would put them over, over the top against St. Mary's? There's a couple of things I think working for Grand Canyon and also a couple of things working against St. Mary's. It, we, you know, I, obviously they beat Gonzaga without Joshua Jefferson in the WCC championship, but I still think that the loss of Jefferson is something that's going to hamper them. Now, every day that goes by is another day that Randy Bennett can figure out what to do without Jefferson. We saw them utilize Mason Forbes in a way that was productive against Gonzaga, which was not the case the first time those two teams played, well, the time they played in Moraga without Jefferson. Uh, Forbes, not a good offensive player, but very good defensively. And when, when used correctly offensively, he can really help that team. And, and so I think if they're more ready for, for a, a post-Jefferson era, I think that helps them. But I do see Grant Grand Canyon finding ways to take advantage of that. Grand Canyon's a great offensive team or offensive rebounding team. They're a great offensive team in general. Uh, they are a good but not great three point shooting team. Certainly, for them to pull off the upset, they are going to need to shoot it a little better. They have a really really good mid-major scoring guard in Ty and Grant Foster. We've seen just like really high-level guards do some damage against St. Mary's. That I mean, even Deuce Turner at San Diego dropped a 30-burger on them. Like, it has happened in the past, and I think if Grand Canyon can get Grant Foster going, if they can crash the offensive glass, again, without Jefferson there, you're a little bit more limited offensively. The game being in Spokane, I'm incredibly interested in what that looks like. Anton Watson said he wants that whole crowd to look purple. Um, Nolan Hickman said he hopes the Gonzaga fans show up to that one. I'm curious what that crowd will look like. Will it be a lot of St. Mary's fans who are used to traveling to Spokane once a year already? Uh, will it be people who who are like local people who are anti, uh, anti-St. anti Mary's? Will Grand Canyon fans travel? I mean, it's not that far for them. We know that's a passionate fan base. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle, I think, as well. I don't think it's going to feel like a huge road environment. I also would be remiss to not point out that St. Mary's played in the most uh, the, the most intense version of Spokane in the McCarthy Athletic Center and won. So it's not like they're not capable of doing that. Gonzaga is better than Grand Canyon. But there are enough factors working against them. you got to pick a couple 5-12s. Uh, I think there's a chance that St. Mary's falls here. Uh, I'm also very interested if they do not. Uh, What a matchup between St. Mary's, a great defensive team, and Alabama, a horrible defensive team, but elite offensive team, what that would look like, because that would be a really fun one. That, I mean, for some of the reasons, obviously, like, the crowd is kind of, like, a big factor into Mm -hmm. this one. And I do think that, like, what we saw in Vegas, again, we talk about hostile crowd and whatnot, it's like, uh, they won in Spokane South as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They they were able to win in, in the Orleans as well. They were able to win in the Kennel in Spokane. They have to play in Gonzaga's kind of pseudo home just down the street at the at Spokane Arena, but like the way they used uh, Mason Forbes, I felt like was the different one of the bigger differences in that game. Obviously, like they found ways, and even in the Santa Clara game, obviously he had 18 points in that one. Where mm-hmm. he they started using him as like that cutter to the to the basket, kind of playing him a little bit more as the rim runner. And I think that is what kind of served him well. And I think that's one of the wrinkles because it almost does feel it's like one of, one of the things you cannot give Randy Ben a lot of is prep tech. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It feels like the longer you give him the prep for you, the more ways he's going to find to kind of exploit whatever weakness you might have. Um, And I do think that this team is still rolling defensively. This is still maybe one of the best defensive teams of and I, uh, that the Grand Canyon will have seen all year long. I know they beat San Diego State early on, and that's and that was kind of a different San Diego State team mm-hmm. at that point. That felt like that was right at the stage where San Diego State started to kind of tilt on yeah. the on this the bad side of their season. Uh, but it's going to be fascinating, and I'll be up there in Spokane this weekend, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a rocking house. I think I saw the was the other day they said they announced. It was all sold out for the for the tournament for the mm-hmm. for the weekend. And that's San Diego State. That's Alabama. That's Auburn. It's yeah. UAB. It's a, I I was kind of half joking with some people. It's like, uh, all right, we need to find the San Diego State people and and get on the uh, get on board with each other and just be against the Alabama fandom all weekend long. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> go California versus um, versus Alabama there, um, and just are so thinking about that St. Mary's matchup. So you mentioned like getting by that because I I agree with you. If they were able to get by Grand Canyon, and they, I think it will be a tough uh, tough mm-hmm. matchup. That that Alabama one is fascinating because it does feel like maybe for the first time in a while as a five seed, St. Mary's has a four seed that is vulnerable. Because the last two years they ran into UConn, they ran into UCLA, but this Alabama team has a significant deficiency, yeah. and it's on that defensive side. Yeah, I mean, you've watched Alabama probably more than I have, and so like as you're kind of like looking at that, like that feels like that feels like it might be the opportunity that St. Mary's has to get to the second weekend for the first time since 2010. There's a small part of me that wonders if you even end up playing Alabama in that second round game. I think Charleston's a sneaky good mid-major team. Uh, I picked Charleston to beat San Diego State last year, and San Diego State went to the Final Four in the national championship. So I'm I'm worried that I jinxed myself, and now Alabama uh, is going to go to the national championship <laughs> game. Uh, no, I don't think that they will. They're they're just. I mean, they're, they're, it's not that they're just. Oh, they're better offensively than they are on defense. They're flat out bad on defense. Like this is not a good defensive team. They wouldn't be a good defensive team in the WCC from a metrics perspective. Like this team, they, they don't defend well and they don't protect the rim particularly well. Uh, they don't close out on shooters very well. Like when you watch them play, it's, it's multiple issues on the defensive end of the floor. Now they play at a faster pace. That's going to come down to can Randy Bennett and the Gales dictate their pace and play how they want to play against Alabama. They have proven to be very good at doing that against very good teams. Uh, and if they can do it against Alabama, which I think that they can, that creates a huge advantage for the Gales. I agree. UCLA is a four seed. UConn obviously is a four seed. Really difficult draws for the Gales. This one, not so much. Now, Alabama is a very, very prolific offensive team. And it's going to be how they shoot the ball really well. Mark Sears, excellent three-point shooter. Aaron Estrada, Latrell uh, right cell. Like those three guys can really, really light it up. And I think that they're going to space St. Mary's defense in a big way. Mar- Marcelonis and Mahaney are going to have to play the best defense that they've played uh, in their careers to slow down this Alabama team. But at the same time, St. Mary's can probably score 80, 85, even with their pace against Alabama because of that defense. And if they can score 80, I think they can hold Alabama to under, under 80. So I think that that's a real opportunity for a win for them. I, I, I don't want to say that I think that Alabama is an easier matchup for St. Mary's than Grand Canyon because in a vacuum, I don't necessarily agree with that. But the, there are elements of what Grand Canyon's good at versus what Alabama's good at that I think do make this. Like if you're, if you're St. Mary's, you got to get by Grand Canyon, and then you feel pretty good about your chances of getting all the way into the Sweet 16. And, and I think that that's, that, you know, you just can't look ahead. You just can't look ahead. I know Randy Bennett's going to have those guys focused on making sure they're, they're playing the Lopes before they're playing anybody else. But I like their chances of being a Sweet 16 team if they beat the Lopes. All right. And then just looking at the bracket as a whole, uh, what's, what's maybe that one where you're just maybe outside of the Gonzaga matchup uh, mm-hmm. that you're, most excited to watch maybe not the one like the upset pick or like which yeah. which one is your the one you were like i have i have to make sure i'm watching this game i think one that i'm really excited about is the 710 matchup in the east region uh washington state against drake and uh, obviously i'm going to be intrigued by washington state as a future member of the wcc uh, kyle smith's a coach I've followed for obviously a long time is his time at san francisco where he's had a lot of success there uh, and Drake's one of the most exciting mid-major teams in the country. Tucker DeVries, their starting power forward, sixth leading scorer in the entire country, averaged about 22 a night. His dad, Darian DeVries, is the head coach at Drake. And so I think there's a really kind of intriguing matchup there. Wazoo, uh, obviously, Miles Rice is one of the best stories in college hoops, 15 points per game for for him. But last year, he was going through chemotherapy after having Hodgkin's lymphoma. So for him to return to the, fl- the floor, average 15 a game, help lead this Wazoo team who lost a ton of talent in the transfer portal last year and ends up nearly winning the Pac-12, like really fun story for, for Kyle Smith and Wazoo. And, and I think that the match, I, I don't love that they got paired with Drake because I'm kind of rooting for both those teams and obviously only one of them can advance. But uh, that's definitely a game I got circled of like, hey, I, I really want to check this one out and, and make sure I don't miss it. All right. I mean, I'm, that's definitely one on my list. Um, all right, Andy, thanks for hopping on. It's great always chatting with you. If we're on the eve of March Madness. The Zags will be taking on McNeese. The Gales will be heading to Spokane uh, to take on Grand Canyon. Uh, one, once again, thanks for hopping on. It's always great to chat with you, and we'll definitely catch up, if not before the end of the season, uh, at some point in the offseason. Yep, looking forward to it, Zach. Thanks again for having me on.